our year-long preaching theme is the story of Jesus this year. And we have already, starting back at the end of August, worked our way through the early life and early days of ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, going through the gospel stories and um, taking a four-week break for a very unique series during the Advent season called Witnesses. And by the way, a couple things there. On Christmas Eve, uh, many of you were there, but we had an all-time uh, record attendance for Christmas Eve here at FBCG with almost 3,600 people in our six services. And together, you collectively gave over $45,000 to our mission partners that we are giving that gift to. So thank you so much for your generosity there. And if you missed one of the witnesses, the first person accounts of the story of the birth of Christ, uh, you can go to our website fbcg.com and listen to those. Um, it's a very uh, interesting and unique way to present that part of the story. But now we're in the second week of a series called Teach Us to Pray. And I want to, uh, where we're looking at the prayers of Jesus and some of the things he taught us to pray just in a short four-week series. And this is week number two. And I want to begin with a story. Uh, years ago, when I first got to FBCG, I was serving as a student ministry pastor, the role that Sterling Moore has today here at our church. And uh, for years, I led what we called Senior High Bible Study, which was on Wednesday evenings. We met in a home or some other facility in town, and I had, would have 30 or 40, maybe a few more kids than that sometimes. And we would always have uh, some games and some fun, and we'd have some small group time to talk over some questions, and I would try to teach a little bit. And at the end, we always had a little short time of prayer, when I would ask the students if they had anything they wanted me to pray about for them. And sometimes there was nothing, so I'd just wrap up with a prayer. And sometimes they would mention things in their lives, like maybe a grandmother who was sick or in the hospital, maybe something going on at home or a school issue or something, and then uh, I would pray for those things. Well, one night uh, when I asked the question, there was a young man at the Bible study who was new. He had only been to one or two Wednesday nights, maybe even one. Um, I didn't know his family. They didn't come to our church, and I barely knew him, um, but he raised his hand in the back of the, the group, and I was kind of surprised. Usually a newcomer wouldn't do that, but he raised his hand. So I said, yeah, and he said, uh, would you pray that I won't get grounded? And I said, Can you give me a little more. And he said, well, um, here's what he said. Here's, he was honest. He said, here's what happened. I got home from school yesterday and went out with some friends. And one thing led to another, and we stayed out all night. I said, you didn't go home? He goes, no, we stayed out all night. Then I went to school today, and after school we hung out again, and then I came here. I said, so you haven't been home yet? He goes, no. So when I get home, my parents are going to be mad, so please pray that I won't get grounded. And so I thanked him for his honesty, then I said as gently as I could, you know, um, I don't think I can pray that exact prayer, uh, but here's what I'll pray. I'll pray that when you go home, that God will give you the courage to do, to do what you did here tonight, that you'll be honest, that you'll tell your parents exactly what you did, that you'll tell them that you're sorry that you, that you did that and put them in that awkward situation, and that you are willing to accept any punishment they want to give you. I'll pray that. How about that? And he looked a little disappointed, but that's how we prayed that night. Research shows that almost everyone prays in our culture. More than half of Americans say they pray on a daily basis, and 80% of Americans say they pray at least once a week. Now, that may not be surprising to you, because you probably fit in one of those categories, but it is surprising from the standpoint that we know that today in America, church affiliation, religious affiliation, is dropping at an alarming rate. Uh, this weekend, only about 20% of all Americans will be in uh, some sort of worship service in whatever denomination they choose. Only about 20%, one in five, which is an all-time low for our culture. And yet 80% of us say that we pray at least on a weekly basis. Even atheists pray. Studies show that among those who don't believe in a personal, sovereign, creator God, between 6 and 20% of them pray on a daily or weekly basis. You might ask, well, to whom do they pray? If you don't believe in a personal God, who do you pray to? Well, they, create, they pray to a God, small g, of their own creation. You know, I believe there really no, no such thing as a true atheist because everybody has a God, small g. Everybody has some way they orient their life and they orient their priorities. Now, as Christians, we don't pray to an unknown God. We pray to a God who reveals himself to us through his word. Even so, we know there are different kinds of prayer and different kinds of experiences with prayer. For example... There are what I call habitual prayers. These are prayers that we have basically memorized because we use them so often. Prayers we don't have to really think about too deeply. For example, prayers at mealtimes. If you pray at mealtimes, you probably have a set of prayers you repeat almost without thinking. When I was growing up, we'd pray, Dear Lord, please bless this food to our bodies. Amen. 
Didn't have to really think about what that actually meant. Bless this food to our bodies. I never really thought about it. It's what we said at mealtimes. Sometimes prayers at church are like that, like that. Some of you grew up in traditions where uh, the Lord's Prayer, maybe it was called the Our Father, was prayed week in, week out. Tim Keller, a pastor in New York City, says the Lord's Prayer might be the most repeated set of words in all of human history. I think that could be right. Maybe you grew up in a church that repeated those words. Last week, Pastor Jeff preached on that part of Jesus' teaching on prayer. If you missed his sermon, again, go on our website. You can catch it because we didn't have Saturday night service last week. Catch his teaching on the Lord's Prayer. It'll be helpful to you. Memorize the rote prayers uh, bring comfort and a kind of a spiritual predictability to our lives. There's nothing wrong with them. But prayer is to be a little more than ritual. There are also what I call desperate prayers or help me prayers. These are the prayers we pray when we're in trouble, when something's gone wrong, uh, like for my student friend all those years ago. We pray when we're sick. We pray when a loved one is sick, when a child is sick. Uh, We pray when we face financial struggles or job loss. We're going to see in a couple of weeks that God actually encourages us to come to him with help me or desperate prayers. And then there are also prayers that I call ceremonial prayers. Um, in a worship service like this evening or some other public gathering where prayer is sort of required, kind of professional prayers. Um, It's not uncommon for my wife and I to be at an event somewhere in the community. Maybe it's a cookout at someone's house or some other function, and it kind of gets to a place where there should be a prayer. And if people know what I do, everybody turns and looks at me when when it comes to that time. And sometimes just for fun, I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, it's Friday, I'm off duty. Now, you're never really off-duty when it comes to prayer, but I'll do that just to see what people do because everybody panics. Who's, who's going to pray? If the professional won't do it, who's going to pray? There are ceremonial prayers. And we see these kind, all these kinds of prayers and more in the Bible. On top of all that, we have questions about prayer, deeply personal questions like, does God really hear my prayers? Uh, does he really answer when I pray? How does it work? How do I know if I'm doing it right? What if nothing happens at all? Have I done it wrong? Today we're going to look at two stories Jesus told in Luke chapter 18 to teach us something about how we are to experience prayer. So I'm going to open up the scripture. I'm going to read this to you. I will put it on the screens behind me so you can watch there as I read. Luke says, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Let me pause there. The context of this, these stories I'm going to give you um, is that in the previous chapter, Jesus has just finished a, a series of verses where he's talking sort of prophetically about the end of time, about his ultimate second coming and bringing judgment on all things. So that's kind of the context. That's why he says, pray and not lose heart. Okay. Then he continues. He said, In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner." I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, now Jesus gives us three examples of prayer here, three um, examples of how we are to pray and what we are to learn about prayer. First, we see a persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. One of the things my parents did when I was growing up One of the best things they did was to make prayer part of our everyday lives. My father was a pastor. 
So church was a big part of our lives. We were in church a lot. But prayer was not something that we only did at church. Prayer was something we did at home every day. They prayed with us before we went to school every morning. They prayed at dinner times with us, meal times, every time we had uh, any kind of meal together. They prayed at night with us before we went to sleep. So prayer sort of bracketed our home life. Prayer was part of everyday lives. My wife and I have tried to do similar things with our boys as they've grown up. Grown up. Now these aren't complicated or theologically deep prayers, just everyday simple prayers. Things like, thank you for the day, Lord. Thank you for our family. Uh, help us to be aware of your love for us today. Help us to be aware that you guide us and are with us in, in all our situations. Just simple prayers day after day. One of the prayers I remember my mom praying for me repeatedly as I was growing up was for the special woman that someday God would bring into my life as my wife. Day after day, she would pray, pray that same prayer. And I could hear it coming as she would start to pray. And I'd be in bed at night, and she'd come up to do my bedtime prayers. Uh, and I would hear that prayer coming, and I'd be like, Mom, I'm 12. You know, she'd pray the same thing over and over again. But I am grateful that she prayed that particular prayer. Grateful, because I think God did eventually answer that prayer. Back to the text. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Now before we get to what he's teaching us about prayer here, I want you to get a sense for Jesus just as a teacher. As a teacher. As our teacher. Most of us can think back in our school days and we could identify a favorite teacher or two. Even if it was in a subject you didn't particularly like, some of the best teachers we had growing up were teachers that had the ability to somehow make us learn even when we didn't really want to. And a lot of times, in my experience, those teachers had two things in common. Passion for the subject matter and a sense of humor. I tend to remember the teachers who had a sense of humor. And I think Jesus had both passion and a sense of humor. Here's the picture he paints for us. A poor widow comes to a cold-hearted judge and she wants justice. She believes she's been wronged in some way, treated unfairly. Now you need to know here that Jesus' audience, who he was speaking to here, would have immediately assumed several things in the setup of this story that we can kind of miss living in our modern culture. For as a woman at the time, she wouldn't have had any rights in a legal court of law. She wouldn't have come before a judge at all because the, the courts belonged to men at that time. It was really weird that this widow would be in front of a judge. They would have assumed she was there because she had no husband to re represent her, no sons, no uncles, no high-powered lawyer. She was all on her own at the mercy of the court, at the mercy of the judge. She had nothing going for her except her relentless persistence. Jesus presents this poor widow as a kind of pit bull of persistence. She grabs onto this judge and she just won't let him go. Day after day, he comes to his office and day after day, there she is waiting for him, waiting to plead her case. She just won't go away. And eventually the judge says, I can't take it anymore. He caves in. I'll give you whatever you want just to get rid of you. Just leave me alone. Okay, and I think there's something gently funny about the way Jesus tells this story. I think people who heard him tell this story would have smiled, maybe even laughed right at that point because they saw what he was saying. They saw how ridiculous the situation was. And he means it to be funny, but he also means us to teach us something about prayer and something about God. Here's the point he's making. If a simple, poor, uneducated, but very persistent widow with no rights or standing at all, can wear down a law school educated, seen and heard everything, hard-hearted judge, how much more does a loving and gracious God, our Heavenly Father, respond to our prayers? See, earlier in Luke's Gospel, Jesus had this to say about the character of God in Luke chapter 11. He says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I think that's what Jesus is saying here in this story. Luke continues, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect 
who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, that's Jesus, will he find faith on earth? Jesus seems to be saying to us here that we are kind of like this widow in his story. Things aren't right. We know things aren't right. We have this deep sense that the world around us is not as it should be. Justice is not being done, at least not consistently. We see children who suffer. We see the innocent gunned down. We see evil seeming to win the day. We wonder, why does God allow these things to happen? How long will it be before he makes things right? The Bible promises that one day Jesus will come again, will return to destroy sin and evil and establish his eternal kingdom. But when? When is that going to happen? Jesus is telling us, don't lose heart. Now, the verb lose heart comes from a Greek word that means to become weary or to give in or to become cowardly. Jesus is saying, don't give up. Even though things look dark, even though things look hopeless, even though it seems that evil and suffering are going to win the day, don't give in. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't stop asking. Don't stop praying. Jeff covered this last weekend, and again, you can listen to his message online. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the longing of our prayers, how he wants us to pray, and that hasn't happened yet. God's will is not being done on earth, but we pray for it and we long for it. We long for God to make everything right, even in our own little lives. We know things are not as they should be. Jesus wants us to know that prayer is persistence. Later in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. Pray without ceasing. I don't know about you, but I hear a phrase like that. I think, how? How can anyone pray without ceasing? How does that happen? What's that about? Well, it helps me to think about it this way. Most of us have a cell phone. You probably have yours with you right now because we are never without our cell phones. Cell phone, iPhone, whatever you have, Android, but we have these phones. And have you ever stopped to notice, I'm sure you have, how attached we are to our phones? We're attached to these things, right? If you're ever at a stoplight in your car and you stopped, just look around you how many people are in their car and what they're doing. Even drivers. Four out of five of them at the stoplight are looking down. And you know what they're doing? They're holding their phone down so nobody sees them, but they're checking because they're staying connected, right? We were in Chicago right before Christmas looking at the lights and so forth. I saw people crossing major city intersections like this. And there's cars everywhere going every which way, and they're they're looking at across the street. Why do we behave that way now? Because... These keep us connected, right? They keep us connected. If you ever lose your phone or you leave it at home and you go to work without it or you go anywhere without it, how do you feel? Disconnected, right? You feel disconnected. You feel alone. You feel adrift in the universe, right, without your phone. Well, I think there's an analogy there for prayer. See, I don't know how this technology works. I just, it's like magic to me. I don't know how it works. Maybe somebody in here knows how it works, but I don't. It's like magic. Well, prayer is kind of like God's technology. Uh, I don't know how it works, but it's how we stay connected to God. We don't have to know how the technology works to use it, just like our phones. Jesus is encouraging us to use it constantly to be persistent. Now, let me ask you a couple questions. How connected are you? How connected have you been recently to God through prayer? Let me ask you, Have you stopped praying for anything? Is there something in your life that one time you prayed about or for and you've just kind of given up and stopped? Maybe you've lost hope, lost heart. You think God doesn't want you bothering him about that anymore? I'm going to come back to some of those questions at the end of today's message because it's important for you to think about those things. So we see, first of all, a persistent prayer. Secondly, we see a proud prayer. A proud prayer. When I was in college, and for a time afterward, my father 
was pastor of a small church just outside Orlando, Florida. He took the church when it was very small, maybe 50, 75 people. It grew to over 10 years to about 300 or 350 people or so. So when I was home, that's the church I would go to. And over a few years, I got to know some of the people there. Every Wednesday night, they had what they called prayer meeting. 20 or 30 people would gather at the church for a time of prayer, about an hour's worth. So sometimes when I was home in the summer, I would go to prayer meeting. Um, it wasn't often, but I would go. And there was an older gentleman in the church, probably in his late 60s at the time, which seemed ancient to me then, doesn't seem so ancient to me now. Um, he'd been at the church forever through several different pastors and had been an elder or a leader in the church for a long, long time. And he was always at prayer meeting, always. And he was always one of the main voices at prayer meeting. In fact, he was always one of the longest prayers, one of the most eloquent prayers at prayer meeting. He was sort of the LeBron James of prayer meeting. I know I use too many sports analogies, so how about the, he was the, the Pavarotti of prayer meeting. He was the Rembrandt. Okay, you get the point, okay. After a while, my brother and I, who was also in college, we would, we would go to prayer meeting just to wait for this guy to pray. His name was Mr. Iker. And it was a little immature of us, but we did so because his prayers were almost always about his wife. And it was interesting to us. Over several weeks, we got to know a lot about Mrs. Iker, even though she wasn't there. She didn't come to church anymore, we found out. Found out that she had a temper and a sharp tongue and a critical spirit and a lot of other things we learned about her. His prayers would go something like this. Oh, Lord, you know how much I've suffered, Lord, with this woman you gave me. Lord, you know how my wife has turned her back on you, Lord, and on me. You know her tongue, Lord, how it hurts and how it cuts. Oh, Lord, you know how faithful I've been to you and to her all these years. You know, I've served you all, I, and blah, 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 blah. He'd go on and on and on. No wonder, we thought, no wonder she doesn't come to church anymore, right? But his prayers were spectacularly selfish and self-promoting. And if there's a longer story of that, which I'll tell at some other time. Luke writes here, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now this is a tale of two men, two prayers, and two ways of approaching God. The first man, he says, is a Pharisee. Now the Pharisees were among the most religious people of the day. They were the ones who prayed the most flowery prayers. They were the most religiously educated. They knew God's law. They gave the largest gifts to the temple treasury. They tended to be self-righteous certain of their own goodness before God, Pharisees. The second guy in the story is a tax collector. Now, a tax collector was like the polar opposite of a Pharisee. A tax collector was utterly despised in his own culture because they made their money by working for the hated Romans. They extorted their own people. They weren't seen as religious or righteous at all. They were as far from a Pharisee as you can get. Now, Jesus has set up this contrast on purpose because he's creating tension in his listeners. Remember, he's a wonderful teacher. Let's look at the Pharisee's prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. What do we see in this prayer? Who's this prayer about? Him, right? Thank you that I am not like other men. Look at what I do. Look how much money I give. What's he most grateful for? That he's not like that guy, right? He sees religion as kind of a competition. So what's Jesus saying here? He's saying that the one that his listeners think of as the most righteous, the one who is considered the most religious, has utterly failed in his attempt to approach God. In his praying, he has not sought to worship God. He has not sought to honor God. He has not sought to know God. He has not sought to listen to God. He has only sought to glorify who? Himself. And this would have been shocking to those listening. They would have been thinking to themselves, whoa, 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 wait a second, Jesus. If that guy, if that religious guy who knows all about religious things, if he's doing it wrong, what hope is there for us? How can we approach you? And that leads Jesus to the third kind of prayer, which is a humble prayer. A humble prayer. Years ago, a woman from our church family was facing a kidney transplant surgery due to a, um, a chronic illness she had. She had had multiple surgeries over like 20 years, a lot of suffering, and finally it came down to a kidney transplant. So we had a special time of prayer for her right in this room next door here. Several of us as leaders and pastors were with her. 
her family was there, her husband, her son, and she was going that week up to Minneapolis to have, her, uh, have a kidney transplant. And we prayed for her, we laid our hands on her, anointed her for healing. We prayed for the doctors, we prayed for the kidney, we prayed for the whole process, for her recovery, for her strength to return. And that's how we all prayed, except for her husband. Uh, and he, was, he waited and waited and waited. He was a very quiet, shy man. And when he finally prayed in his quiet voice, this man who had watched his wife suffer for 20 years, here's what he prayed. I remember it to this day. He said, Lord, please forgive me for this terrible anger I've had toward you all these years. The humility and the honesty of that prayer, the room got silent, just dead silent. And it felt like the Spirit of God just filled that room. It was like only then did we really begin to pray together. And because of that man's honesty and his humility. Look what Jesus says. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus here is saying there are only two ways to approach God. One way is seeking to justify yourself. The other, second way is seeking to be justified by another. That is, we either approach God trying to demonstrate our own goodness and worthiness, presenting our religious resume, as it were, that's called religion, or we confess that we are sinful and in need of God's grace and forgiveness, and that's called the gospel. That's called relationship with God. I've heard it several times just recently in conversations. Well, that's what it's all about, one guy said. It's all about, right, just be a good person, be the best person you can be, respect everybody. We're all going to the same place, right? Well, no, not exactly. That's not the gospel. Jesus didn't come into this world, take on human flesh, allow himself to be nailed to a Roman cross, raised again from the dead three days later so that we can be pretty good people. That's not the point. He came to save us because we need saving. Tim Keller says, when you realize that the antidote to being bad is not being good, you're on the brink of understanding the gospel. When you understand that the antidote to being bad is not just being good, you're on the brink of understanding the gospel. Jesus is saying that there are only two ways to approach God. Proudly, look how good I am, God. Look at everything I've done for you. Or humbly, I'm sinful and broken. I deserve nothing. Without your grace, I'm helpless and lost. Just as there are only two ways to think about salvation. Doing enough religious things to justify yourself before God or accepting by grace what he's already done for you. That's gospel. And all this translates into two ways to pray. One way is as a religious performance, the Pharisee, Mr. Iker, back in the day, or as a personal relationship marked by humility and persistence, the tax collector, the poor widow. I think what Jesus is teaching us here is that prayer is first and foremost a relationship with God. It's a relationship. It's a relationship that begins with honesty. It's marked by humility. And it's carried through persistence, not losing heart. I want to close with uh, giving you a chance to just respond to Jesus' stories here. So just I want to have you bow your heads just for a couple of minutes. I'm going to wrap up. So just bow your heads and get kind of quiet. Go into the inner place of your heart. Prayer begins with honesty before God. You may be here tonight, and you may be saying to yourself, you know, I haven't done this in a long time. This feels a little weird. I'm not really sure what to say. How do I get started? It starts with honesty. You start with right where you are right now. In your heart of hearts, what would you say to God as a friend? You would say maybe, you know, I feel a little bit like that tax collector. Just have mercy on me. I know I'm not perfect. Or maybe it's, you know, I haven't talked to you in a long, long time. I'm not even sure how to start. Or maybe you'd say, you know, to be honest, God, I'm a little mad at you right now. Or to be honest, I'm exhausted. I've lost hope in some area of my life. 
I'm tired. Start with where you are. And then let me ask you as well, is there some area of your life in which you've lost heart? Is there something you stopped praying about a long time ago because you kind of gave up? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's one of your children's struggles. Maybe it's something a loved one is going through. And you just kind of, you just kind of stopped asking because you don't want to bother God about it anymore. You gave up. Jesus says, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Knock on the door of heaven again. Be honest with your heavenly father. He wants to give you good things. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to meet you in this conversation that we call prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these two beautiful stories. Thank you for inviting us into a relationship with yourself through this gift called prayer. It's a mystery to us. We don't quite understand it, but you encourage us to use it often, daily, as a conversation. So may we learn to approach you in humility. May we approach you in confession and with great persistence. Our prayer tonight is that you would teach us to pray. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.